on the scene He's got the voice that's mean Asking those questions that you never seen He's got that fire Burning bright and clean Andrew Keen Making waves Break the routine On the keen on show He brings the heat Asking the minds Digging deep till they bleed No sugar coated truths No lies to deceive Andrew Keen The master of the interview beat the knowledge he's got the flair challenging ideas with a fearless stare with every question he's uncovering what's there andrew key the true seeker he's aware hello everybody over the years uh universities haven't always come out of our show very well um lots of writers have written books about the problems, the structural problems, the crisis of the university system, particularly in the United States. Evan Mandry is a well-known skeptic. Uh, he came on the show a couple of years ago talking about how elite colleges divide, disorient, and diminish us. Um, uh, Stephen Jones came on the show, another critic of modern universities, asking what's the point of universities in an age of radical inequality and fake news and we've even had some critics of modern universities like the trinity college uh, academic davarian baldwin who believe that universities are plundering our cities that they are the new colonialists so i think it's time for the universities to fight back my guest today um daniel porterfield is the ceo of the aspen institute one of the most erudite and enlightening of American institutions. And he's also the author of an important new book, I think, a way of fighting back on behalf of the universities, Mindset Matters, The Power of College to Activate Lifelong Growth. Daniel is joining us from Aspen in Colorado. Uh, Dan, welcome to the show. Uh, before we get to your defense of universities, why do you think there are so many critics now of the contemporary American university. Well, I think that there have always been critics, but some of the problems have continued or exacerbated, especially the, the challenge of the cost of going to a residential uh, university or college. And I think also we're in a moment in American history where institutions of all types are being critiqued and criticized a lot, whether it's the media, the courts, the electoral system, banks, foundations, and then universities are a part of that. They're an important institution, enduring, and so they're subjected to critiques. And I think that most of the critiques have some basis in fact, it's just they don't tell the whole story. Before you took over Aspen, you were the, uh, the guy who ran a Distinguished College uh, in Pennsylvania, Franklin and Marshall College, named after the great American Ben Franklin. Um, so you know colleges inside out. What do you make of so many of the political disturbances on campuses this year, particularly in the context of, of Gaza? We've done a couple of shows on that too. So I've been out of it for about five years. And you're probably rather pleased about that, given <laughs> the nature of universities these days. No. No, the reason I'm not pleased, but I take the point, is that college and universities play an important role in building young people to be able to uh, learn and grow for their lifetimes, which is essential for our economy and for our, if you will, our, our citizenry, um, especially if you're thinking about how fast change is happening today in our world. The rate of change because of technology, demography, and climate issues is really accelerating and given that the plethora of good and bad information flowing at people at ever increasing pace having a strong college education that positions you to grow for the 50 or 60 years after college when you're working and serving as a citizen is really important and so i don't negate any of the critiques but i think don't think they tell the whole story which is why is worth college saving and investing in why is it worth it to encourage young people to see college as part of their future? And why is it important to address the problems? The answer to me is that at the undergraduate experience level, a residential college experience has a proven track record of igniting young people to believe and know that they can learn and grow for their lifetimes. 
And that's even more important, again, because of the pace of change today. Dan, uh, your book, uh, as I said, your new book, Mindset Matters, The Power of College to Activate Lifelong Growth. Uh, You noted earlier, it's the elephant in the room for parents, how expensive college is. I know you've got three kids. I've got two. We've all, I'm not sure if you actually had to pay for your kid's education. I had to pay for mine. I'm still paying it off. I probably will for the rest of my life. Should college, are you suggesting that college should be thought of as an investment? It's obviously a financial investment from the point of view of parents, but should kids going to college and indeed parents sending kids off to college, should they think of it as an investment? Yes, and and there's a couple different ways to come at the question. One is that um, all the research on the future labor market points to a reality that roughly 70% of new jobs over the next decade will require a four-year degree. Not because the degree is a certification exactly, but because the learning that happens is relevant for human intelligence in an AI world. Secondly, and and by the way, that's been true in the past, that a college degree has enhanced earning power uh, for, for those that hold it. That still is the case. It's probably even more to be the case when artificial intelligence assumes an even stronger role and disrupts so many of today's jobs. The second reason to think of it as an investment is because we should always be investing in young people's capacity to use their talents in the way they choose, to cultivate what's inside of them for a lifetime of giving and growing and creating and discovering and working with others. And so I do think that the 24 seven campus experience defined by engaged peers, uh, lots of different kinds of classes, heavily, heavy involvement, ideally of faculty members and students experience provides a really a beautiful foundation for students developing their own talent, their own sense of self complemented by its benefit to them as workers and leaders in a, in a global knowledge economy. But what's wrong, Dan, with life itself to do that? Um, I'm talking to you from San Francisco. Yeah. All my viewers know I'm not one of the great fans of Peter Thiel, who's a bit of a bete noir out here. Uh, a few years ago, he paid smart kids not to go to college. It was very controversial, but his argument is in a, in a way credible. Why? waste the best years of your life drinking and having sex and 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 not sleeping when you could be out in the workforce well that's not what the college experience consists of Uh, i've spent 20 years working in higher education as a professor a senior leader a faculty member living on georgetown university's campus for eight years with my family and then a pretty hands-on president franklin and marshall the book that i've written digs deep into the experiences of about 35 students that I knew well during their college years and shows in some detail, almost like ethnography or very good journalism, the growth trajectories of those 35 students. And in order to build a book around the growth and learning of 35 students, recounted in real detail, I probably interviewed 100 students that I had known when I was at Franklin and Marshall. And what you just pointed to, the, the concern that college is about you know, paying for the party, base, basically delaying adulthood, um, is, a, is one of the critiques that's out there. But when you actually live on a campus, as I've done, and work with students, there's a much deeper, more widespread story about, again, about long, long-term and deeply meaningful growth. I've seen that in class, outside of class, in the work and co-curricular experiences that college provides in the friendships and mentoring and the teamwork needed across a college community and across an individual student experience. And so um, I do think there's a, there's a reality that some students choose to spend their time in college more idly, but my experience has been the vast majority, the exact opposite. They're pursuing growth. So you you say in the book that you, you followed 35 uh, kids through college. Um, How did you select them? I selected them based on watching them when I was in that 24 seven ecosystem of Franklin and Marshall College with them. I knew hundreds of students. And then secondly, 
I interviewed a number of those students when they were a year or two or three years out of college during COVID while I was serving as the president of the ASP Institute. And so I knew enough about their experience to want to showcase and explicate in some detail. So take, for example, the opening chapter where I write about the mindset to think of yourself as a discoverer, someone who doesn't just answer questions, but poses questions in order to find answers no one's looked at before. That's critical for all the fields where discovery is crucial, whether that's in business, certainly in the sciences, uh, in law, um, or in education itself. Being a discoverer is critical to working effectively in those fields and growing in those fields. And then I tracked four students, one whose name was Eddie Alsina, uh, another whose name was um, Charisma Lambert, uh, a third whose name uh, was Wyatt, and a fourth whose name was Morgan, from very different backgrounds, very different circumstances. But in each case, the presence of highly engaged faculty, rigorous curriculum, Pre research opportunities made available to them early in their careers set them up for both a meaningful college experience and then terrific early success now after college. Morgan's earned uh, additional degrees in religious studies. Uh, Eddie is now a clinical psychologist uh, uh, who earned his PhD. Uh, Wyatt is now coaching and teaching in a uh, coaching soccer and teaching in a private school. And Charisma is now pursuing her next degree at University of Chicago, having worked in Teach for America. Each of these young people had particular experiences that made them, A, learn, B, know they learned, C, know they know how to drive their own learning in the future, and D, know that they love learning and that they are a learner. And to me, all those experiences add up to what a growth mindset for discovery across one's life. And the colleges don't do this universally, of course, but it is possible to sequence student learning, to give them advanced learning opportunities, to help them see where they're learning and learn the techniques of learning so that when they graduate, they say to themselves, I can tackle anything. Give me a hard problem. Give me some, a language I haven't learned yet. Give me a, a business that hasn't been created yet. Give me a field where there hasn't been settled knowledge. I want to be the discoverer that points the way. And that is something college does exceptionally well if a student values that. And my second message, I think, to all students is if you would like to develop a meaningful college experience and I hope develop a growth mindset for discovering or creating or collaborating, you need to take responsibility in college to create your education, to lead your own learning, to avail yourself of the resources available to you. Because learning and building a growth mindset is not something that happens because your parents give it to you or your professors assign it to you. It's because you within say, I'm going to drive my learning. And I think colleges do well and can do more to ignite that sense of agency in our students that I'm the one that's going to go forward and do something special with college and beyond. And I've seen many students do that, and I wanted to celebrate that, but show what it looks like in this book. Um, Dan, there's an endless critique, particularly from conservatives, that colleges dominate, especially places like Franklin and Marshall, liberal arts colleges are dominated by leftists, by progressives. Did the students you talked to, did they express any concern about this, that the that there wasn't real intellectual freedom in college, that it was a bit restrictive and that some oh. of the classes they took were somewhat propagandistic? Oh, no, no. I mean, I, I, again, the narrative is out there and people point to individual stories to, to, to advance the narrative. Um, but both my experience at Georgetown and my experience at Franklin and Marshall was one of seeing faculty that were committed to intellectual rigor, to impartiality in how they teach, and to challenging students to learn how to back up their arguments with evidence and with uh, research. And so uh, I don't deny that some faculty in some places have gotten a lot of attention for clearly having a particular agenda, but I did not witness that at FNM. quite the opposite. I saw a community where the key investment by the faculty was in challenging students to 
question sources of received wisdom, to understand their assumptions, and to go forward with fact and evidence-based understandings of the world, and that crossed political background. I have to say, I don't know the actual political perspectives of almost any of the faculty that were at FNM the eight years that I was there. When I sat at the end of the tenure process, approving tenure for probably 20 professors during those eight years, never was there any problem of a professor having an ideological agenda that played out in the classroom. I know it makes for a good story and it gets people ignited and maybe angry and it shouldn't happen. But I did see that impartiality as the norm, not the exception. Dan, I want to get to the break and, and, and get into more detail about uh, what students should and shouldn't be doing in college when it comes to our AI world. But before we get to that break, what did you learn about improving the college experience? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, the kids you spoke to weren't all 100% enthusiastic. There must have been experiences and senses of college that in their mind at least could have been improved definitely what did you learn in that area from from the research and from your conversations yeah definitely uh, look the critiques of what can be better are essential we cannot be we cannot let ourselves settle into complacency and so uh different students express different experiences i want to say something though that in in having a difficult experience early which might be not having access to a class you really wanted to take and being frustrated at waiting or feeling out of place because there aren't lots of other people of your background in the school, uh, or perhaps having an experience with the financial aid office where you're trying to figure out how to make it work, it's not coming together. I write about those experiences because it is in fact, when in dealing with difficulty, students often, have the breakthrough that makes them realize they can solve problems. They can navigate their own environment and choose their direction. So that's one point. The second point I want to make about improvements now is that an area where I think we have potential to serve the country by improving is more emphasis on individualized and personalized instruction of students so that we're not teaching to the masses, but we're teaching individually. And I think that technology offers us a lot of potential for that in the future. Um, so if I were to make a, an overarching critique of all of college, which I don't really want to do, I would say that the students I interviewed say, would say, let's have more faculty engagement in student learning. Let's have more personalized learning. And let's make sure that we can make college accessible to more students from more zip codes all across the country. We're speaking with Daniel R. Porterfield, the author of Mindset Matters, a book in defense, I think, of college. Uh, the subtitle is The Power of College to Activate Lifelong Growth. He used to run um, uh, Franklin and Marshall College. Now he's in charge of the Aspen Institute. And I want to remind everyone that such high quality guests as Dan uh, are brought to us because of our friends at Liberties, uh, an excellent new a quarterly of culture and politics, which actually uh, go very well, I think, with Dan's uh, argument in Mindset Matters. Going to run a short feature on liberties, and then we'll be back with Dan to talk about universities in particular in the AI age. So don't go away, anyone. We'll be back in a second. The noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties, it's not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can subscribe to Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We're speaking with Daniel R. Porterfield, the author of Mindset Matters, the power of college to activate lifelong growth. Dan, of course, uh, we live in the age of AI, of smart machines, of open AI. Some people have suggested that it will make us redundant, certainly make our intellectual skills redundant. But I think your argument in Mindset Matters is the reverse. Actually, AI uh, underlines or compounds the value of universities. Explain why. A couple of different angles on this. First is that um, in an AI economy, 
which is only now coming into focus. It will evolve and develop in the years ahead. Human intelligence is critically important. What do humans bring to work and the knowledge creation and the artistic creation, the business leadership that AI can't bring? And there, I think, being able to work in teams, being able to communicate clearly and effectively and understand the perspectives of others, being able to have not, uh, I'd say, not, not simply uh, argumentation, but better argumentation, more grounded argumentation. All these kinds of things are critical. Management of people, responding to those we are serving, whether they are patients or uh, students or customers, all of that, if you will, human skills, AI will not replace. And there may be new discoveries that humans make because we ask better questions of the enormous data sets that AI can bring together. I'm thinking that humans will help develop education systems where learners of all ages at home or in class can have personalized learning. I'm thinking that it'll be humans that ask questions about the data sets around diseases that will allow for more innovative approaches both to treating disease and to preventing disease. And I'm thinking it'll be humans that are able to take the, if you will, the economic power and if disruptive of AI in business and make sure those businesses evolve so they meet the needs of workers as well as customers. So all of that, the cultivation of human intelligence, which means an intelligence that's growing and learning and adapting is something college does do well and can do even better in the future. Also, we should remember that a big part of the college and university mission is to drive knowledge creation so that we have better medicines, we have better businesses, we have better diplomacy, we have uh, better judges. All of that, the knowledge creating part of universities may take off exponentially because AI enables us to do computation at a much faster and more robust level. We've had critics on the show, Dan, of meritocracy or the idea of meritocracy. It's, again, a, uh, a, a thing that many people are critical of, like universities. Should universities be the engines of meritocracy? Should they be places of competition? Do you believe in grades? Should some people come out of universities with more distinction, at least intellectually or academically, than others? Uh, yeah, I think the notion of meritocracy is um, is is always one that's being challenged because the notion, the definition of merit, is in, always in flux. You know, merit in what context? For example, uh, um, Albert Einstein was highly meritorious as uh, uh, as a thinker, a mathematician, and a physician, but he wouldn't have been as meritorious if he was serving in the Marines. For example, what is merit? What is talent? Those, that, those questions evolve as times evolve, but the notion that universities should challenge people to be and do their best and should give students an accurate sense of how they measure up against others and whether or not they are learning and growing, I think it's very important. I do think grades are valuable. I think even more valuable is hands-on faculty instruction so that a student comes out of the experience of getting a B knowing the difference between a B and a B plus and an A, and perhaps hungry to go get a B plus or an A next time. Um, I, do, I think grades are incredibly important, and I also think that the notion of merit is very important. Um, one of the things that I write about in the book is that if you think about what are the talents needed to thrive in the high-touch, academically challenging environment of Franklin and Marshall College, you may get it, you, you, uh, it leads to some interesting thoughts. So it's a small school, it needs students who wanna get involved. If people don't get involved, the theaters will be empty. The labs won't have students researching. So saying yes to opportunity is a talent when it comes to Franklin and Marshall College. Similarly, curiosity is a big talent. Why? You go to liberal arts school, you're gonna take some classes in fields you've never studied before, say geology. Almost no one takes geology in high school, yet in college, Franklin and Marshall generates 20 geologists majors and graduate a year. Why is geology important? Well, is earth science important? Is energy sources in the earth important? 
is uh, uh, the, the nature of the Earth's composition and how, what, what may or may not have come from uh, outer space important? Yes. Um, so curiosity matters. And then a third thing that matters, because it's a hard grading school, is resilience, being able to handle getting a C and not giving up or having a really hard assignment and powering through it so you can get to the next assignment, maybe better able to manage it. We found that curiosity, saying yes to opportunity, and resilience were powerful predictors of success at Franklin and Marshall College. And yet many schools don't have a theory of talent or merit. They say they're for meritocracy, but they don't know what merit is. It's so hard to define. We took a shot at defining it. And one of the things that came out of what I just said, the learning that led us to prioritize curiosity, saying yes to opportunity and resilience, is we realized that talent is very present all across America, in lower income communities, as well as middle and upper income communities. In fact, sometimes those traits, curiosity, wanting opportunity, and having resilience are even overrepresented in lower income communities where students have faced and overcome more challenges. So what I hope happens in the years to come is that across higher ed, institutions become more precise in what they mean by talent and merit and I predict you'll see different definitions because different schools attract different kinds of students. Are you suggesting then in a way that we need to quantify some of these skills? You mentioned curiosity. Another skill that comes up a lot in our AI age is empathy. Should yeah. kids be coming out of college, not just with academic grades, but grades on their curiosity, their social skills, their empathy? I'm not sure it's grades. Uh, that they should come out with. Um, I hope they have experiences that foster um, curiosity and resilience. Uh, and if you define empathy as being able to see the world through the eyes of another, then I'll say empathy. Um, but it doesn't mean it's grades. Now, something that we may be moving to as a society is that in addition to having a transcript, which gives you grades in courses taken, that schools begin to develop what I want to call portfolios, where students can document the experiences they've had that have increased their capacity for things like cross-cultural communication, research skills, um, holding demanding jobs. My hope is that 10, 15 years from now, the transcript will be still present, but that portfolios and demonstrated improvement in, in skills uh, and other capacities will be more, more readily documented. I think that we're on the pathway to that. I think AI could help with that. And um, I think that ultimately what we want to be able to do is define college learning more holistically than just grades and then foster it more intentionally across our many endeavors that happen on a college campus. Ever since the invention, Dan, of the internet, there's been an ongoing debate about the value of the physical versus the virtual in every field from yeah. corporate life to entertainment to, of course, education. All sorts of very successful online education startups like the Khan Academy. In your book and in your analysis, did you conclude about the value of the physical college as opposed to the, the virtual one? Yes, I don't want to hold them against each other because I think the virtual can be incorporated into the physical. Um, but it's difficult to incorporate the physical into a virtual only environment. Um, but I do think virtual learning is valuable in different ways. And um, so what students value about the physical environment uh, is in no particular order here, A, the proximity to serendipitous exchanges in the library, on the athletic field, in the residence hall, that spark connection, learning, and meaning. That serendipity is, um, is built into the feature of the residential campus. So it's not accidental. It's just that which encounters one has, there's serendipity. Secondly, the presence of actual adult mentors who get to know students, spend time with them, uh, help them grow and learn, but also help them to build their skills that's something that every survey of young graduates across the country has always found that was a differentiating value of a, of a good college experience, faculty mentors. And then a third thing that I like about the, the physical environment, the residential environment, 
is that it allows students to have the affective experience of problem solving with one another because they're on a variety of teams that whether it's the team as classroom or the team as student government or the team as a work group that's serving the campus or a team as a group putting on a play or a team that's bringing people to orient them to college life. It's team after team on a college campus. Students have a team experience five or six times a day. And that collective experience, I think, builds citizenship in a way that is harder to build in the more atomized experience of virtual learning. We talked a little bit earlier, Dan, as parents about the cost. Um, some people suggest, including some guests we've had on the show, that because college now has become so expensive, it's also incredibly exclusive. Um, and it's become an institution which is compounding the inequalities of the America of the 2020s. In your view, is that true? And if it is, do we need to radically rethink what college costs and who and how it gets paid for. Yeah, I think that's an overstatement, candidly, to say that it's simply that college is simply perpetuating existing inequalities um, at point one. I do think that um, that the system, however, is too expensive. So I, I can hold those two views at the same time and not feel that, that they are uh, contradictory. In terms of addressing cost, what, what I would recommend is what I would call a new compact, a new agreement among families, schools, and society, business and government, on how to address cost. And my recommendations would be that three things need to happen, broadly speaking. The first is that tuition and the cost of college does need to go down. Yes. Secondly, I think that the government's participation in supporting uh, lower income or middle income students has declined precipitously over 30 years. And so that needs to go up. I would recommend doubling the Pell Grant and supporting more states who are invested in financial aid for their students. The third thing that has to happen is that when students do borrow some money for college, and I think borrowing is fine as long as it's not crippling to one's long term interests. I think that then it should be possible to pay off loans much more easily by having a small percentage of your income be the way you pay off a loan with debt forgiveness for people who go into the army or police forces or teaching say. Those three steps, cost containment, investment from the government and financial aid, and uh, new strategies to pay off reasonable and fair debt would be the new compact I would call for. Um, I, I want to point something out that our community college system across America is extremely e effective or getting e getting more effective, but consistently uh, has delivered in helping students from lower resources have a foothold into family sustaining jobs. That's an important part of a comprehensive approach is making sure that community colleges also are good. And of course, community colleges propel students as transfer students into four year colleges. So that's a big part of, I think, societal improvement on this is making sure the community college system works. And then um, maybe as one other point about all of this is that it does matter that colleges work harder to demonstrate the value of the four-year experience. And that's why I wrote this book, to try to show the value in human terms so that before we throw out the whole system, we can say back, well, of those who value it, why do they value it? What is it they value? And this is what my stories explicate. They, students value a personalized education where they're known as an individual, challenged to grow, and leave college believing and knowing because they've done it, that they can drive their own development in their adult lives. What about, Dan, you ran a college, so you know this problem all too well, the, the purging some of the high-priced bureaucrats, maybe not the college presidents, but there's a sense that a lot of the money going into college now is being used to pay bureaucrats uh, who, who don't teach, who for many people don't really add much value to the system. Is there any truth to that critique? Uh, 
potentially depends on the school, of course. So I don't want to make a universal statement about 4,000 colleges. So um, you're not going to make any enemies? Uh, well, no, let me, let me keep going, though, because I think I can give an answer. I think part of what has grown, we call it, people call it bureaucrats. That's not actually right. It's actually people who are providing student services. So our counseling centers have grown enormously, yes, but that's in response to an absolute demand that nobody disagrees with. Our career centers have grown considerably. That too, though, responds to a demand, a yearning of parents and students for individualized coaching to help students prepare to enter the work world. And then a third aspect of what has grown is our teaching and learning centers, and whether it's in quantitative fields or in the in writing, where there's more need for more students to get personalized tutoring outside of the formal classroom. All of those developments, which have added employees, have been in the service of providing a better education to students. That said, it's a fair point. And yes, as if, if colleges are to drive down their costs, they are going to have to reduce some, ser some services to students and some organizational roles. And maybe AI will provide a way to do that. That's an interesting idea. AI replacing expensive bureaucrats. I think a lot of people be on board. Dan, I know, Dan, you've got to run. So final question. Your book is about the power of college to activate lifelong personal growth. But in an America where there's, most people I think would agree both on left and right, um, a scarcity of civic virtue, of civic understanding. Um, what about the role of universities, not just in activating lifelong personal growth, but national growth too? Two answers to that. Um, in one of my chapters, I write about the power of teamwork and how universities and colleges provide multiple team experiences. I showcase one group of students who work together to write the constitution for the college house, or it's kind of like a residence hall, but much more um, learning oriented. And that was an exercise in, de in democratic principle as students worked together to write the system that they would then live under as students. I also write in that chapter on teamwork about a soccer team coached by uh, Dan Wagner at Franklin and Marshall that went to South Africa as part of being on the team to offer goodwill learning experiences and soccer clinics for low-income youth throughout South Africa while learning about what their sport looks like on the global stage. And so, so one thing is I'm positive that the college experience done well cultivates collaboration, teamwork, learning to resolve differences, um, learning to critique group performance in order to improve the next time. Positive, that's a big plus of the college experience, which speaks to your question about what kind of a citizen we're gonna have. But the second point I wanna make is that also, Franklin and Marshall College tripled our financial aid budget and tripled our outreach to rural America and urban America to find high striving students who were curious, who were resilient, who had a vision of education and who said yes to opportunity. And we tripled our aid budget, we tripled our enrollment of low-income students and almost all of those students graduated on time they performed at or above the school level in lots of ways. And now today, if I just quickly mention it, one named Markira Jones, first-gen college kid from Coatesville, Pennsylvania, the almost only one in her school to go to college, now a clinical psychologist working with low-income students. Um, or secondly, Akbar Hussein, immigrant student, just about the only one from Norristown School who went to college. Now he's the chief policy advisor for the governor of Pennsylvania. Or Sheldon Ruby from a deep red rural community where no one went to college, where there was skepticism about college, goes to Franklin and Marshall College, is exposed to all these different influences. Now he's a diplomat in the US State Department representing America in dialogue with the diplomats of other countries. So we are a more inclusive and I believe a more empowered country in a time of change when Akbar and Markira and Sheldon can go from communities where almost no one goes to college to leadership roles in our country as a psychologist, a policy leader, and a diplomat. That's a way that higher education contributes to the greater social good, not just to individual excellence. Because when we find and educate and equip young people to give back, what we find is that they love it and that's what they wanna do. And I've found that low-income students in particular wanna give back. 
The more low-income students we can equip with a great education, I believe, the stronger our society will be, and also the stronger universities will be for having a more pluralistic undergraduate community. Thank you. Finally, Peter. some, some yeah. good news for America and uh, a fight back in terms of the value of universities. Daniel R. Porterfield's new book, The Mind, uh, Mind Not The Mindset Matters, The Power of College to Activate Lifelong Growth is just out. Dan, I want to thank you so much for appearing on uh, Keenon. And we'll have you back on again because I think it's an important voice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Great questions.